Amen. Go ahead and go to Titus tonight. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. And let's go ahead and start reading in verse 10. It says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So I want to point out a few things to you here in this passage. First of all, notice this group of people that he's saying, you need to stop these people. You need to shut their mouths. These people are trouble. They subvert whole houses. They're teaching commandments of men that turn people away from the truth. And he and he specifies these people, they're of the circumcision. These were Jews that uh, maybe some of them were saved. Maybe they just pretended to be saved, but they're trying to bring these traditions in and they are what they are doing. It's turning people away from the truth. And it says there at the end, you know, what they're doing. The Bible says that it's abominable and they're disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They're good for nothing. But the verse I want to focus on a statement that's made in here in verse 15. And this is where we get the title of the message. He says, unto the pure, all things are pure. Okay, that's the title tonight, but then and it says, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And I don't have time to go into just uh, everything that went into this, but one thing that you see throughout Paul's writings, and you see it in the book of Acts, uh, it was just, it was a common thing that they fought right from the very beginning is you had all, you had these Jews that would get saved. And many times they would bring, try to bring in their old Jewish customs. And we see Jesus dealt with the same thing. These people, they would come up with their own doctrines, their own teachings. You see how they would make a big deal about washings and stuff like that. And we see here, even in, in Titus, that they're still trying to push a lot of these dietary things. And it's like they would look at what people would eat and they make a huge deal about it. And notice when he says, unto the pure, all things are pure. Okay, somebody who's right with God, somebody who is, you know, clean in their mind, somebody who, whose thinking is right, you know, they see things as pure. But those who are unbelieving, those who are defiled, they see everything as bad. And you know, we see the same thing going on in churches today. This goes on in Baptist churches where it's like people, they will take things and they make everything bad. And it's show, and really it's revealing where their thinking is. And I don't want to get into too many specifics yet. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But when you look at the context of this statement, under the pure, all things are pure, it's very clear in this passage that the Jews were bringing in their commandments of men and they were making them apart, adding them to salvation. You know, you need to do these things if you're going to be saved. We see one of the teachings that they had uh, that they dealt with is some of them tried saying, unless you're circumcised, you know, unless you keep the law of Moses, you know, you're not saved. They tried teaching that. We see the same thing today, you know, where churches, you know, if you haven't repented from your sins, if you haven't changed your life, you're not saved. Well, what does it mean to repent of my sins? Well, you got to quit doing this and you got to start doing that, you know, and it's commandments of men. You know, we've come up with these things and, and maybe they'll even take, you know, biblical commands, things that the Bible tells us we ought to do or tells us we shouldn't do, but you don't make those a requirement for salvation. That's heresy when you do that. That's adding works to salvation. And, you know, and these people here, maybe they were doing that. But another thing we know that they did too, is they would often, you know, rob believers of their liberty in Christ. You know, they, maybe they wouldn't make the claim you have to do these things in order to be saved. But, you know, now that you're saved, if you want to keep your salvation, you've got to do this and this and this. And that is in the Bible, never teaches that things. And if we're not careful, we can allow what the Bible calls evil people 
to come in and dazzle us with their goodness, supposed goodness, and they can cause us to be turned away from the truth. And while on the outside, we might get to where we look better than ever, you know, on the inside, we're as evil as we ever were. And I'm telling you, that happens. You know, and how does this happen? How do people get turned? How can you get turned away from the truth by someone's goodness? You know, I mean, isn't it always good to be good? But listen, we can get so caught up. You know, an extreme example of that is the Amish. Okay, you know, what is the first thing you notice about Amish? What is the first thing you think about with the Amish? The way they dress. I mean, look at the way these people dress. You know, I mean, they, they look so nice. They look so holy. They look so godly. You know, these are, these must be great ones for people. And they might be. All right. You know, they might be. But understand in the eyes of God, just because they put on a dress that looks like it's from the 1800s, doesn't mean that they're righteous in the eyes of God, does it? You know, they, they could be, you know, some of them, you know, some Amish people are as mean as all get out. You know, most of them seem like they're pretty judgmental, you know, and down on everybody. And, uh, uh, you know, down on the English, as they call us, you know, <laughs> in some places. And, you know, and these Amish people out here, I get mad. You know, they, they're pretty nice. All the ones I've met are real nice. But um, these Amish out here, I, I see them all as liberal Amish because they don't do horse and buggy. They all drive cars. Their women are always on their cell phones. And I was like, you know what? If you're going to be Amish, go all in and get your horse and buggy live out on a farm, lose your cell phones, lose your electricity. Come on. You know, I, I like people that are fundamentalists and everything. If, if you're a Muslim, I got more respect for you if you want to blow me up than if you're one of these moderate Muslims. I, I have no respect for those people. If you're willing to kill yourself to kill me, you know, I'm going to hide from you. But at the same time, I've got, I've got a little bit of respect. And listen, if you're going to be an Amish, go all out, lose the electricity, lose the cell phones, and I, I do these people, they got one foot in the world and one foot in the Amish. And I, I got, I've got no respect for that at all. But, but anyway, that's a side note. But we do, we, we often, we get dazzled by these things. We get impressed by these things. Have you ever been to one of those churches? And listen, I'm not against this. I'm not saying these places are all bad, but I've been to those churches where a hundred percent of the people in the church, I mean, man, do they dress right? I mean, boy, they got their hair combed right. They, you know, they, I mean, they do, they've got the great music. I mean, this church is just as strict as all get out. I was talking about this morning, a church I went to, I was 19 years old and I was impressed with this church. Everybody in their church. I mean, conservative dress. They had the most conservative music. I mean, this church was strict across the board. And I found, I found they, their uh, YouTube page the other day. They, they put their sermons on YouTube. And I was like, man, I remember those people. And I remember being how impressed I was with this church and everybody in this church. And I listened to that pastor preach a message that was absolute garbage. And he he was basically preaching, if you're not doing all those things, you're not saved. I mean, he was preaching a message on repentance and was just, I mean, he just made up his own definition of repentance and then just kept using the word repentance and saying, you know, using that as proof for everything he had just said. And basically the gist of that message, you know, if you don't look like them, dress like them, listen to their music, blah, 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 you're just not even saved. And I'm listening to that message. I'm thinking, buddy, you're not even saved. I mean, man, are you impressed with yourself? And I used to be impressed with them too. And any, you know, any of us too, if we went to this church, you know, we wouldn't be offended by anything, you know, as far as how they dress, the music, we'd probably be offended by the preaching. But Barbara, don't worry about the clock, all right? Everything's all good, all right? You don't have anywhere to go. So <laughs> just, I have a, you're getting me distracted back there. But listen, we need, we need to understand that we can get caught up in that. We can get to paying attention to people instead of paying attention to God. And listen, these people are dangerous that do that. That start adding you know, their own doctrines, the commandments of men. And why are these people dangerous? Well, first thing they do, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to show you why people like this are dangerous. And like I said, I'm all for being strict where the Bible's strict. But we don't get to just make up our own commandments and make up our own rules and add things to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. These people that get us all caught up in themselves and how strict they are and all their rules that they follow, understand these people, they remove faith from the gospel. Say, how do they do that? Well, Paul here, he's saying, when I came, I didn't try to impress you all with fancy speech. I didn't do that. I didn't try to blow you all away with my wisdom. The Apostle Paul was clearly a very educated, smart person. He didn't try to impress anybody with that. He was rude in his speech. You know, he probably preached hard. He probably ran and raved a little bit and, you know, kicked the pulpit and all those things we're not supposed to do. That's probably what Paul did. You know, he wasn't trying to impress these people with his eloquence, with his knowledge. We know he knew a lot of language, but he didn't start speaking in tongues and other languages just to impress people. He didn't do any of that. You know, and he wasn't determined to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hey, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? And it better be Jesus Christ. He didn't want to hear about their changed life. He didn't want to hear about, you know, hear them start singing the things I used to do. I don't do them anymore and start talking about themselves. He wanted to know, hey, do you have Jesus Christ? Did you put your faith and trust in him? And we see that many people, they do. It's it's very common thing that you'll have this preacher up there that everybody just looks up to. Man, he's so godly. He does this. He doesn't do that. And it's like everybody in the church is required to be like that preacher. And listen, I'm all for following a godly example, but y'all understand we're supposed to be following after Christ. He's supposed to be the goal. He's supposed to be the standard, not another man. And what happens without fail, when that happens, when it becomes all about a man, everybody in the church gets all focused on that man. And listen, we've all got an agenda. I've got the things that I hate, the things that just bother me, probably more than they bother God. I think I'm probably bothered more by a guy in skinny jeans and a pink shirt than God is. That's very possible. Yeah, you hear me rant on those things all the time. But you know what? It could come to a point, you know, if I'm like some of these preachers that are out there, the power goes to the head, you know, I make that like a requirement for salvation. I won't trust in a salvation that won't even get you out of them skinny jeans. You know, I mean, if you're still dressing like a queer you, there's no way you got saved. Well, listen, that that's my thing. All right. I think that's dressing like a queer. I can't show you in the Bible for sure where that's at. You know, and I, I think I'm right. But at the same time, you know, I, we got to be careful with that stuff. And then before long, you know, you're not wearing the skinny jeans, not because you are trying to impress God. You're trying to impress me. And it becomes all about me and what I think. And many people, they get us looking at them in the flesh instead of looking to Jesus by faith. We're supposed to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I'm getting tired of preachers, you know, telling me, you know, using preachers from the past as examples of what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to teach. Listen, I'm all for learning from people, but listen, if I can, if I find something in the scripture, that contradicts what a preacher from the past, especially a dead one, taught. You know, I'm supposed to follow the Scriptures, not a man. But it's all about following men. I, 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 I'm tired of hearing people quote Spurgeon all the time. I'm tired of people proving the Scripture wrong with Spurgeon. I don't care what Spurgeon said. It, it, who cares what he said? Even if you want to pick out some of the good preachers from the past, you don't use them to correct the Bible. But they do all the time, don't they? I mean, you'll hear preachers get up and you know, they'll read their obligatory scripture they're supposed to read. But then they want they start, you know, here you all need to listen to this portion of, you know, this Jack Hiles book I read. Well, listen, he might have had some great stuff in there, but we're going to preach Jack Hiles instead of preaching the Bible. Listen, if Jack Hiles preached the Bible, then I should be able to preach the Bible and I'll honor Jack Hiles that way. You know, by preaching this from the same book that he did, not by preaching from his book and people, they, they do that and they will never veer from anything. These guys in the past taught, it becomes about men. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse one, it says, then spake Jesus to the multitude and his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses seat, all things whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do, but do ye not after their works for they say and do not now. 
what's, he's telling them, do the things they tell you to do. Why? Well, this, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, they would read them the law. They would read what the word of God said to do. So even though these people weren't right with God, he's saying, you know, do the things they're telling you to do. These are good things they are telling you to do. But he said, do not after their works for they say and do not. What does that mean? Well, you know, we can, we often, the things that we say we do are good. For example, you know, I think you ought to go to church. I'll preach that you ought to go to church. And I might go to church all the time. I might be somebody who I'm at church every time the doors are open. But you all realize if I'm at church and I'm here for the wrong reasons, I'm still sinning. If I'm here and I got a bad attitude, I'm just here because I want to impress everybody else. I'm still sinning while I'm here. And there's a lot of good things that the Bible tells us to do. But if we do it for the wrong reason, we're still sinning, aren't we? And these Pharisees... We, it's very clear in the Bible, many of the things they did, it was to be seen of men. Therefore, when Jesus is saying, you know, do not after their works, you know, he's telling these people, you need to do what they tell you to do, but you need to do it from the heart. You need to do it without sin. He says in verse 4, and then sometimes too, they would add things to the scriptures. Verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Hey, and what's interesting about that, he said, these things that are adding to you, they're grievous to be born. Well, what does the Bible say about the commandments of God? His commandments are not grievous. But let me tell you, the commandments of men are sometimes. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Most of these difficult things that preachers put on their people, it's all the things that they focus on the most are the things that are about being seen of men. And listen, don't anybody take this the wrong way. I am 110% for dressing right. 110% for it. But I'm going, to tell, I'm going to show you in a little bit why some of these people make such a big deal about that. And while it is such a focal point, while it's necessary for salvation practically or necessary for church membership, I'm going to show, I'm going to show you why it's such a big deal to these people. Because once again, we can take things that are right and if we're doing them for the wrong reason... We're still sinning, aren't we? And I do. I think there's a lot of people that when it comes to how they dress, yes, they're dressing right, but I still think they're sinning. And because of why they're doing it. And I'll show you that here in a little bit. But, you know, he talks about they're doing these things to be seen of men. They may broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. So we, and then, uh, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and shall be humble himself shall be exalted. So we see here that it is. It's very, many people they will do things as a way to elevate themselves, as a way to exalt themselves as a way to just make themselves look good. And the, Jesus warned us about these people. Not everything that these people would tell you to do are bad things. Some of these we would say are even good things, but they're doing these things to be seen of men. And that is, that is, a, that is a dangerous thing. And we need to understand that the things that we do, you know, we're supposed to, you know, as, as a pastor, I want to get you looking at Jesus by faith. I don't want to just get you looking at me. I do want to set a good example, especially for a newer Christian, okay, that's going to be, you know, just starting to increase their faith. I need to set a good example to try to help them out. But eventually, I hope I can get people in the church where they're not paying so much attention to me, but they're paying attention to Christ. And they're doing what they're supposed to do by faith in Him and not just to impress me. That's, that's not what it's about. Uh, it's not about just impressing me or impressing men. But they make assurance of salvation many times based on our works after salvation instead of the blood of Jesus. You know, what is it these camp meeting preachers are doing all the time? When they go around, you know, telling you, know, if you, you know, I don't trust the salvation that won't even get you into the house of God. You know, I won't trust in the salvation that won't even get you to give up your cigarettes and all these things. You know, they'll throw in all these things saying, if you haven't quit these things, you're not saved. But the Bible teaches very clearly that we are justified by his blood. 
That's the proof that we're saved. Nowhere do you see in the Bible that we prove we're saved by our works. You know, these guys, these can meeting people, they can't get past, you know, the Bible's just way too clear on for by grace you saved through faith, the not of works. It's way too clear. And so many of them, they won't go as far as saying, you know, you have to do this and this and this to be saved. But if you don't do this and this and this, you're not saved. And everybody's got their own interpretation of that. Everybody has their own standard of that. They all have their commandments of men that they add on to that. And they'll, they'll use to scare people in the church, especially young people. And I've, I've seen this my whole life where it's like, you know, listen, if you have, if, if you're a parent who grew up in the world, all right, and you did a lot of bad stuff when you were a teenager, you know, eventually, you know, what happens many times, you get to a certain age, you learn a bunch of lessons and you're like, I can't believe I ever did that stupidity. But do you all realize the reason you did that stupidity? It wasn't just because you weren't saved. It was because you were in the flesh. Our flesh lusts after sinful things. And do you realize your your, your teenagers that you have, your kids that grow up in a Christian home that have been in church all their life, do you realize they're made out of the same flesh that you are? And even if they get saved at a young age, they're going to come to a point in their life where they want to do some of the bad things that you used to do. And they don't have your life experience. They don't realize that, hey, this stuff, you know, you're going to regret it later. Okay, but what I've seen happen over and over again, teenagers, they start struggling with these things. And then all of a sudden, my my kids must not be saved. You know, I don't know what's wrong with my son. I don't know why he's so interested in this girl and why he's chasing after this girl. You know, I mean, you know, saved people don't want to fornicate. Well, listen, teenagers are going to want to, all right? It's just, it's, it's the flesh. And you got to teach them to have enough discipline not to do that stuff. But let, they're going to want to do things that they're not supposed to do because they're made out of the flesh. And then it's like, and you know, because you know, doctrine is just so bad in church, you have these teenagers, oh man, you know, I listen to this rock and roll song. I watch this bad movie. I must not be saved. And so, you know, they go to the youth conferences and things. They hear strong preaching against that kind of stuff. They hear the preacher get up there. I used to do this and that. And after I got saved, I gave all that stuff up. Oh, well, I just did that last week. I must not be saved. And so they go, they get saved again. And then, you know, a week later after youth conference, the flesh kicks in again and they do the same thing. And they do it all year. Next year they go to youth conference and they get saved again. You know, what, you know, what's going on here? Well, sadly, we're not teaching our young people. Or we're, we, I think in many cases, we're teaching our young people, if you're saved, you're never going to want to sin. But no, you're going to still want to sin. It's called the flesh. And you've got to teach them to walk in the Spirit. And if you'll walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you've got all these preachers that are out there acting like if a person's saved, they're never going to want to do any bad stuff. Folks, that's just not reality. That is not truth. And so they do. And, and they, they I can't figure out why my church members want to do these things. I can't figure out. I, I just can't figure out why I can't get them to give up their televisions. They just, I got to think of something to threaten them with. Hell works pretty good. And so, you know, if you, I won't trust the salvation. I won't even get the television out of your house. Well, listen, it's not because they're not saved. It's just because they're carnal. All right, you know, they need to walk in the spirit. And so they do. They'll start adding these things and make them a requirement for salvation or not a requirement for salvation, but it's like a test of whether you're saved or not. And what these people are doing ultimately, you know, the preacher gets up there. I haven't had a television in my house in 20 years. What's wrong with you? I got saved and I got rid of that. You must not be saved. Now, what are people doing? Man, I want to have what the pastor has. He acts like he doesn't even want a TV. I can't imagine life without a TV. You know, and, you know, I guess I just must not be saved. And, you know, and people can't get victory. in the, If you can't even, you know, you, need, you have to have assurance of salvation to be able to be a victorious Christian. And these preachers, they are, they're getting people looking at them instead of looking at Christ. And it is, it's a dangerous thing. And these people end up becoming idols that people turn to instead of a living God. I want, I want to be like that person. I want, I want to be like the pastor. And 
you know, listen, there, there's nothing in the Bible that shows people being attracted to Jesus by his clothing or even by his ability to keep the law. You know, I can't think of anywhere in the Bible where people went up to Jesus and said, hey, how come you've never sinned? Have you ever thought about that? Wouldn't we notice if someone was perfect and without sin? You know, how, and we don't know a lot about Jesus' childhood, but we know that Jesus had brothers and sisters. And we know that they weren't believers at first. They didn't get saved until later. Well, listen, wouldn't his brothers and sisters have noticed, hey, I fight with all my other brothers and sisters. They've all lied about me. They've all done... Jesus never has. And maybe I'm wrong. Can anybody think of anywhere in the Bible where Jesus approached Jesus and, or somebody approached Jesus and said, something's different about you. You never sin. Nobody ever brought that up except maybe Pilate when he was trying to find out if there was anything you know, worthy of him dying for. Nobody did that. They came to him because of the miracles. Why is that? Maybe it was because Jesus didn't make a big show of his perfection. Jesus didn't go around when he was preaching saying, you know what? I never have done this. In my, I've never committed one sin in all my life. He never did that, did he? He, he never used himself as an example of how to live. Now, is he an example of how we should live? Are there other places in the Bible that tells us, you know, that we should walk in his steps and, you know, use him for an example? Absolutely. But did he go around doing that? Listen, if anybody could get around and say, if you all want to know what to do, just look at me. Just do what I do and you'll be... Jesus didn't do that. He didn't get up. I've never watched one TV show in all my life or, you know, whatever they did for entertainment back then. I've never said one cuss word. He didn't do that. He didn't make a show, but yet preachers do it all the time. Getting people to look at them. And if anybody could have done that, it would be Jesus because he is the one that we're supposed to look to to save us. But he didn't do that. Jesus never broke one law, yet no one ever talked about that because he didn't make a show of it. But the Pharisees made a show about how they kept the law, didn't they? When they didn't really keep the law. So, listen, we ought to, a red flag ought to go up when people start doing that. When a preacher gets up and he spends most of the sermon talking about himself and the way that he lives, a red flag ought to go up because he's not perfect either. He ha he's a sinner saved by grace just like we are. And Jesus never even did that. So, that ought, you know, we ought to be concerned about that stuff. But these people, they are, they're dangerous. They get us looking at them instead of looking at Christ. And I know preachers that they are, they are known for their high standards. And other preachers do. It's like they pattern their lives. You know, Dr. So-and-so, you know, he preached against this. You know, Dr. So-and-so, he preached for all his life against men having facial hair. And you know what? I'm never, I'm, I'm never going to grow a beard. Well, you know, bless his heart, you know, for doing that. But good night. Jesus had a beard, folks. How do you get up and preach it? It's a sin for a man to have a beard. When, when Jesus had a beard, but some guys have done it. And there's preachers today that they're still down on, and they're not, they don't point to scriptures on that. You know who they point to? The men of God. I, you know, preachers who won't wear pleated pants because Dr. So and so preached against it. You know, wire rim glasses because Dr. So and so. Are you kidding me? We're going to preach a sermon about that? And we're going to force that on people because of Dr. So-and-so? That's ridiculous. And folks, that's dangerous. And let me tell you, some of these people that I'm thinking of, that I'm being nice and I'm not saying any names, I've been hearing what they've been preaching lately, and these people, they don't have salvation right. They do not have salvation right. People that I've been taught to you know, look up to, these great heroes of the faith, these examples of who we're supposed to follow, these are the people that we want to be like, they don't even preach salvation right. In fact, it's exactly what the Bible is warning us about here in Titus chapter 1. These people are reprobate concerning the faith. They're good for nothing. They're, what they're teaching, it's a false salvation. Therefore, nobody's getting saved because of it. It's good for nothing. So how can you say that? Look how holy these people are. They're holy compared to me and you maybe, but in the eyes of God, they're still rotten. They're still filthy rags. 
We're not supposed to be looking to those people. And so look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. These people, dude, they rob our liberty in Christ. You know, I, you know, I don't know, you know, I got to find glasses to buy, but man, everything's wire rim nowadays, you know, and I, I don't want to break any of God's laws and God's commandments, you know. I mean, I got, uh, you know, I broke my electric razor and I got to go to church today, you know, with whiskers, and, you know, and I, I, I'm not going to be right with God, you know, what, what, what am I supposed to do? And, you know, it's, it, you know, people that are constantly worried about stuff that we don't really need to worry about. And listen, when you're, listen, if you're worried about facial hair, I promise it's not because of God. All right. It's because of a, of a preacher. And that's not right. Galatians 5 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. What is he saying here? He's saying, listen, if you are getting circumcised as a way of salvation, y'all understand you've missed the mark. You've fallen from grace. You're not saved. Because if you're going to try to do it, get salvation by keeping the law, you're a debtor to keep the whole law. And so the Bible specifically mentions circumcision here. But you know what? Today, we've got a bunch of other things that preachers have come up with. You know, except you be, become a member of a church. You know, then you're not really saved. Well, all right, fine. You got to become a church member. Now you got to get baptized. You got to take the Lord's Supper. You got to go soul one. You got to read your Bible every day. You got to pray every day. You know, you, you know, we got we got to keep all the law, folks, if that's what we're going to make it about. And really, the whole point of us calling on the Lord for salvation was supposed to be because Lord, I can't keep the law. Lord, I can't turn from my sins. Lord, I am only sinful. I am only evil. If I'm going to get into heaven, it's going to have to be because you gave me a free gift. And I believe you'll give me that gift if I ask for it. And that's and when we call on the Lord, He gives us that gift. And it has nothing to do with our works. And when it says here, you know, um, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Okay, when the Bible talks about being justified, that's not talking about salvation, but that justification is proof that we're saved. If the proof of your salvation is how you keep the law, the Bible says you've, you're fallen from grace. Our justification, proof of our salvation, is in the blood of Jesus. And we need to remember that. And listen, I'm all for keeping the law, but not as a means of salvation and not to prove that I'm saved either. That is when we're getting, we're, you're getting yourself in trouble. And so when you add works to salvation in any way, you miss the mark. You're not saved. You didn't fall from grace, meaning you, you were in grace and you were saved and you fell from it. No, you fell, you fell away from it. You fell short. You never got it. Those people that are, are trying to turn their life around as a means of salvation, they didn't make it. They've fallen from grace. You missed the mark. You didn't get saved. And so when a believer is deceived into thinking he needs to do something to stay saved or prove he's saved, he ends up losing his liberty in Christ. I think there's a lot of people that get saved and then some false prophet teaches them, well, listen, if you haven't done this and this and this, you're not really saved. Well, oh man, well, I want to have assurance of my salvation. I like to be able to, and so it's like, they are, they're like working so hard to make sure they can keep all these laws. And listen, when it comes to preachers who preach like this, if you give them one thing, if we all 100% line up with what he teaches in one area, he's going to add the next thing later. And he's going to keep on adding things and adding things. And before you know it, man, we, we're just in bondage. And listen, you go to one of these really, really strict churches sometimes, and I'm all for strictness. But it needs to be because you're doing it because you love the Lord, not because you have to. Are these not the most miserable people in the world? They are. They're, they're miserable. They're mean. These churches that are like that, they've got the most gossip and stuff going on in that church. You've got everybody tattling on each other all the time. You know why? Because they're, they're ticked off. Every day they're ticked off that they got to dress that way, that they, you know, that they 
you know, they're still bitter. All the kids are angry. Their parents were throwing their TV out and stuff like that. And just because of the preacher and everybody's just miserable. Nobody's doing anything because they love the Lord. It's all about just pleasing people. And, you know, we could go to that church down the road where, you know, people get away with more stuff. But oh, a preacher said those people aren't even really saved, you know, and then he's going to preach that message. They went out from us because they were not of us. And, uh, you know, man, I'm still trying to make sure I'm saved. And everyone's miserable. No one has any liberty. And that, that's dangerous. That is not what God wants. God wants us to be obedient to Him because we want to. Listen, I want my wife to stay with me. But you know what? I don't think it would help our marriage if I was like, you know what? I need to petition our government to make a law forcing women to stay with their husbands. Because then I wouldn't have to worry about my wife leaving me. Now listen, should people get divorced? No. But do I really want them to pass a law forcing my wife to stay with me? Because if they do that, then i got to wonder every day, why is she still here? Is it because she has to or because she wants to? I would prefer it be because she wants to. That's what, that's what I would like. That's what I would prefer. I think we'll have a better relationship that way. And God wants us to be obeying Him, not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we love Him. That's what walking in the Spirit is. And unfortunately, that is not why people are doing a lot of things they're doing. That church I was telling you about, where these people, you know, we'd all be impressed with them. Listen, they are doing the things that they are doing because they feel like they have to. They're not doing it because they love the Lord. Listen, if everybody in our church starts dressing like them, acting like them, that's great. I just hope you're doing it because you love the Lord. Not because you think you have to. Not because you want to impress me. That is not what it's all about. Some, pre, some people are scared to death of their pastors. I mean, they, do, they, they have a lot of control over them. They really know how to freak the people out. They can tell the good stories. You know, let me tell you about the last family that left our church. Well, I'll take you over to visit them next week. They're in the cemetery, you know, you know, you know, just, you know, and they will now freak out. I ain't leaving that church. That'll, I'll, I'll get in trouble. And they do, they use these stories and it's ridiculous. And everybody's in line in that church and they're all terrified and everybody's miserable. There is no liberty. Nobody's doing anything because they love the Lord. And there's a lot of people in these churches too. They're not saved. A lot of people aren't getting saved. You know, they'll have some visitors come into that church and maybe they're looking, maybe they're wanting to get saved. But it's like they're looking at everybody else in that church and saying, I can't be these people. I can't. Be. Listen, if that's what they're seeing, if that's what they're thinking, we obviously got them looking at the wrong person, didn't we? We got them looking at us instead of looking at Christ. And that's who they need. That's who they need to look at. But look at what it says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. So ultimately, what these individuals are doing, and this is where we're going to get to uh, what the text verse, I believe, means. They reveal their hearts. By what they condemn. Look, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know how we can find out what's in somebody's heart? Let's just listen to what they say. It leaks out. Okay, the truth, it comes out. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and thy wor by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Our words are what's going to reveal the truth about what we think, about who we are. I mean, and let's just admit it, you know, most of the trouble we get into, it's not because of what we do, but it's because of what comes out of our mouth, isn't it? All right, am I the only one? That ever gets the, in trouble because of their mouth. Uh, that that got me in more trouble growing up than anything. And, you know, and I had four sisters that they did a lot of provoking. But if I could have just controlled the mouth, I would I would have avoided a lot of trouble. But listen, that mouth it reveals our heart, what we really are, what we really think, and how we judge things, how we judge others. It reveals. How we think. We judge what we we judge others based on how we think. Matthew six twenty one says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, 
thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. See, when a person makes a judgment on why someone is doing what they're doing, they're basically saying, this is what I would do if I was in their situation. And that when that Bible talks about two, you know, the light of the body is the eye. Okay, Our eye is what we see things with. And when it says, if the light that is in thee be darkness, all right, then if, and I guess the way to explain this, if all, if we're blind, everything's darkness, isn't it? And if our eye, if we are focused on good things, we're going to kind of see everything is good. But if we see things, everything, you know, things is bad or if in our hearts, if our minds are evil, we're going to see everything is evil. And when it says to under the pure, all things are pure. Okay? When you have a pure mind and a pure heart, you see things that way. You know, you, uh, you know, because back to how we judge people, all right? We, when we, you've ever had somebody say, you know, they think, you know, I'll bet they think this, you know what they're saying? If I was them, this is what I would think. This is what I would say. Why are they doing what they're doing? You know, they, they just sing that special in church because they like to get in front of everybody. Well, you know why you think that? Because that's the only reason you would sing in church. So you can get in front of everybody and impress people. That's why you are saying that. You know, you'll see, they'll see two people talking and maybe it's, you know, looks like a very quiet, private conversation. I'll bet they're gossiping about me. Why do you think that? Because if anytime you're having a private conversation and you're talking like that, you're always gossiping about somebody. We judge people based on how we think and how we act. There are some people, you got to be careful how you text them. I've known people like that. They are so negative that everything you text them, they take the wrong way. Have you ever done that? Sent somebody a text and they just completely took it the wrong way. I mean, I've, I've had that happen many times where I just completely offended somebody with the text. And it's like, why are you offended by this? And then they'll kind of explain to you how they, and it's like, that was, didn't even cross my mind. You know, and the problem is not, it wasn't with me, it was with them. They've got a dirty mind. They've got a messed up mind. And when it says in, in you know, under the pure, all things are pure. Uh, but uh, what, well, let me go back to that verse. I'm not going to quote it right. Uh, Titus chapter 1. Go back to Titus chapter 1. I want to make sure I quote this right. says, yeah, under the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. There are some people, they just see evil in everything. You know why? Because they're evil. They've got, a, they've got a nasty heart. And some of these people too, that we look at and we say, those people are so wonderful. They're so godly. You know why they think all these things are evil that aren't evil? It's because they've got a dirty mind. Have you ever known someone that just, you couldn't say anything and they took everything you said as dirty? You know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I was very innocent. I started working at the Walmart distribution center in Spring Valley when I was, I was 19. I was just about to turn 20. And man, I worked with some pervs out there. And I had these two guys that I worked with that, and you know, we were, uh, the place just opened. We were doing all these cleaning projects and I was doing these projects with these guys and we're working and we'd be talking and the one in particular, his, his mind was just so dirty. He was just a, just a nasty individual. And, you know, and I'm innocent, and I would say things, and then these guys would laugh because they would take what I said and turn it into something dirty. And I didn't even know what they were talking about half the times. And I'm thinking, I can't say anything without them turning it into something perverted. Now, why did they do that? You know why? Because those guys were pervs. They, they were perverted in their mind, so they would take everything I said and make it into something perverted. But me, I've, I've got a pure mind, and the things I'm saying, they're completely innocent. And I remember we were talking, I was talking about, you know, God and the Bible, and I gave one of them a Bible. He said, he said, if I would give him a Bible, he would read it. So I went and I got him a Bible. I gave him the Bible. And so the next day when we were at work, the other guy already had a Bible, they both had told me they were going to read their Bible that day. And you know what they did? Both of them read Genesis 1. I told them to start in John, but they started. They read Genesis chapter 1. 
And one guy's like, yeah, I read Genesis 1. I, I noticed that part in there about the herb bearing seed. So God made marijuana, huh? And then the other guy's like, yeah, I noticed that same thing too. I saw it. And it's like those guys both read Genesis 1 and all they got out of it, they didn't get out of it. God created the world. That God spoke the world into existence. That God spoke the stars into existence with the word of his mouth. They didn't get that. What did they get out of it? God made pot. Therefore, it's okay. And I'm just like, I think reading the Bible made them worse. You know why it did? Because these people, they were, they were defiled. They were perverted. And so they see everything is that way. And there are, there are, there are people out there that they have turned, they, they turn everything into something bad. They turn everything into something evil. Why? Because they're perverted and they're evil. They think everybody thinks the way they do. But listen, there's a lot of people there. They're just innocent. You know, and you know, there's people out there that they, they're offended by a guitar. They don't allow guitars in their church. Well, listen, I'm sorry. I never went to the bars growing up. You know, I, I, I've, I've not been in those places. I never went to the rock concerts. I think the way I play the guitar is very appropriate. I think it sounds nice. I think it's great. And not my guitar playing, but just that type of music. But these people, they see guitar and they, well, you know, they're thinking of country singers. I, I, don't know, I don't know what they're thinking. But they make it into something evil. And then what do they do? You know, they start condemning guitar music. You know, even drums. Listen, not, not all drums are bad. Okay? I know you can go crazy with the drums, all right? If, if they were a drummer in a rock band at one time, I can see that being a stumbling block for them. But listen, I never was into that. I don't listen to rock music. I'm disgusted by rock music. And you can, you know, some people, they see a drum set and they freak out. Well, listen, we're not going to get a drum set up here. I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, under the pure, all things are pure. There's a lot of people, they could see that drum set and they could hear those drums and so we could play those drums and it'd be completely appropriate. There'd be nothing wrong with it. There'd be nothing offensive. We wouldn't be violating any commands in the Bible. But let me tell you, if we ever did get a drum set up here, there'd be a lot of preachers ready to throw me into hell because of that. And it's because their mind is defiled. They're the one that are evil and they say everything is evil. You know, why is it that some of the people, the most strict people when it comes to dress are the biggest perverts? Some of these Mormons. You know, why is these Mormons are so perverted? Why is it that they have to dress their women like they're from the 1800s? You know why? Because anything that women wear, they're going to think perverted thoughts. You know what? Because they're, they're the perverts. So they see everything. It doesn't matter if the woman is modest according to what the Bible says. It doesn't matter if they, have, they are covering their nakedness. Listen, I, when it comes to the laws of God, we follow those things. But when you start adding to those things and you know, making it into something evil when it's not, listen, it's because these people are perverted. These people are defiled. And we got to stop being dazzled by these people and being impressed with them. God's not impressed with them at all. He says, you know, unto them, you know, they're reprobate concerning every good work. They're making these things, they're making people worse off. And you know, why is it that some of the strictest churches are wrong on salvation? Why is it like that? Because these people, they are, because they're evil, they see everything is evil. Everything is bad. And you know, why are some of the strictest families, the most miserable families in the world? Why is that? Things that pe the, the things that people often condemn. You know, holidays. Okay? You got, you got the people out there that hate Christmas. It's just all pagan. Well, you know why you think that? Because you've got a pagan mind. Listen, I've never thought pagan thoughts for one second on Christmas. I don't see a Christmas tree and have even the slightest desire to worship that thing and pray that thing. Listen, if you're, you know, I've paint, you know, when I was a kid, we painted Easter eggs. My kids have painted Easter eggs. We've hunted Easter eggs. I never for one second thought about worshiping these things. You know, is my salvation in any way related to this Easter egg? I've, I've never even thought that it's never even crossed my mind, but listen, maybe if you were from a Catholic background or a pagan background, you might struggle with some of that stuff. But do you understand, though, if these things are that offensive to you, it's because there's something wrong with your mind. Your mind's corrupted. You know, you've got, you've got problems, not everybody else. And, you know, when, um, you know, Halloween, okay, 
I'm so, I can't figure out a way to make Halloween innocent. All right, you know, proof that ho- there's something just wrong with Halloween. Just look at people on Halloween. Look at the way people act on Halloween. Look at all the Halloween movies. All right, I, I can't find a way to make that innocent, folks. All right, but you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving. You know, Thanksgiving's bad now because it represents us. You know. You know, ripping off the Indians of their land, you know, things like that. You know, we can't even do that anymore. You know, Columbus Day is bad. You know, everybody wants to make everything bad. Things there's nothing wrong with. And the reason they do that is because there's something wrong in their minds. You know, the food. That was the thing the Jews did. We don't have time to read it, but in Romans chapter 14, it talks about that. And listen, we don't want to offend somebody because of what we eat. All right, but understand that if somebody is offended by what we eat, it's because they have a problem. They are the weaker brother. I'm tired of these food Nazis that are around there, and they act like they're the spiritual ones because they don't eat anything. Listen, no, they're the weaker brother, the way I see it. And they are the ones, their minds are messed up. I've never one time in my life ate a bacon sandwich and thought, you know, I'm, you know am I sinning from this? But some people it might be. A Jew that gets saved, they might struggle for a while. And until they get past that, you know, the Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Until, you know, they are fully persuaded in their own mind that it is not a sin to eat bacon, they shouldn't eat it. But let me tell you, I'm fully persuaded in my own mind that it's not a sin. And I fully intend uh, to eat bacon until the doctor tells me I shouldn't anymore because my arteries are too clogged. And even then, I'm probably going to be like, you know what? I'm not going to delay heaven by a year or two, you know, just because of bacon, you know, for bacon. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep eating it. But Colossians 2.16 says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of any holy day, or of new moon, or of the Sabbath. But people do that all the time. They add, the, they add these things on. And listen, it is not okay for us to condemn things, or it is okay for us to condemn things that God has condemned. If God condemns something, there's something the Bible says we shouldn't do, we shouldn't do it. But many of these things that people are condemning are things that aren't even mentioned in the Bible. And they tend to see everything as evil. And when people can only see evil in everything, it's because they are evil. And listen, they might look good. That really strict preacher that doesn't do anything He might look good and be impressive to us, but listen, nine times out of 10 or maybe 99 times out of 100, these guys don't preach salvation right. And if they don't preach salvation right, as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're disobedient to every good work reprobate. They are, they are teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And there are some commandments of men that I think can be good. You know what? If you decide, you know what? I have decided, I have commanded myself that I will never eat bacon again. Great. You might be more healthy because of that. It might be good for your diet. But you don't get to teach that for a Bible doctrine. You can't, you can't do that. If you, if you decide you want to preach or you want to have a commandment in your household, no facial hair. Okay. You can, it's your house. You do that. You command it and don't let your boys shave until they're out of the house. That's fine. But don't teach it for our doctrine. And don't add it on for salvation. And when you do, when you, you know, when you see it that, when you start, when you see or seeing everything is evil, it's because there's something wrong with how you see things. You, you are the problem. And I believe that's what it's talking about here. But under the pure, all things are pure. I'm not talking about the person who says, well, you know, I don't see anything wrong with Drinking. No, that doesn't count because God clearly condemned drinking. There's a lot of people that will do that. I don't see anything wrong with whatever. But listen, if the Bible flat out tells us we shouldn't do it, then yeah, that's wrong. We can condemn it. I'll condemn it all day long. I'm talking about things that are not mentioned in the Bible that are sometimes the focal point of churches. There's a problem there. And these people too, they are, they're making it a part of salvation or they're making it proof of salvation that is not biblical. And we've got to stay away from that. And listen, if, if you see, if you're one of these people, you're just down on everybody, you're down on everything, you see everything is evil, you see everybody is evil, it's because there's something wrong with you. That person who thinks everybody's a pervert, it's probably because they're a pervert. And we, we better watch out for that. And we don't realize sometimes when we're going around accusing people 
and judging everyone, we are revealing who and what we really are. So I would recommend being very careful with that. And so with that, let's all stand together.